now I have the pleasure of welcoming Vivek Maru. Uh, Vivek, uh, quick intro. Uh, Vivek is a pioneering social entrepreneur. He is the founder of Namati, a global movement for legal empowerment powered by cadres of grassroots legal advocates. He also convenes a global network of practitioners to foster greater collaboration and ultimately a stronger movement. Prior to launching Namati, uh, Vivek co-founded Timap for Justice, which has been recognized as a pioneering model for delivering justice services in the context of a weak state and a plural legal system. He's also served as the senior counsel in the justice reform of the World Bank and writes like regularly in academic journals and in the press. Vivek uh, will share how community paralegals around the world are equipping people directly affected by environmental destruction to exercise their rights and offer lessons about law, power, and institutions that emerge from this legal empowerment work. Vivek, pleasure to have you with us. Uh, over to you for the next 30 minutes. Thank you, Santosh, and awesome to see that short video of, of uh, young people acting in a public spirited way in this perilous moment that we are in. It is an honor to be with you guys on Independence Day. Namaste. I want to talk about environmental justice, as, as Santos said, and this is a topic that I think about every day. Sometimes it finds me in my dreams. I wanted to start with a, just a little quiz. So you can go to the next slide. My friend Dallin is helping me. Here's a question for everyone. At the current rate, what proportion of the Earth's species will go extinct by the end of this century? Is it 10, 50, 20, 35%? You please do, if you're on Zoom, go ahead and put your answers in the chat and we will be able to see them. Um, go ahead down and, and, and reveal the truth. It's 50%. We're, we're expecting to lose 50% of all species by 2100. Okay, next question. How many people today around the world live with air that the WHO, which is the World Health Organization, considers harmful to human health. If, you, um, if you're on Zoom, please do put answers in the chat. Go ahead down and reveal the, the correct one. 91%, 91% of people around the world, according to WHO, are living with unhealthy air. Okay, last question. Yale University takes data from, from 180 countries around the world, and it ranks those countries in an environmental performance index. Where do you think India falls on that list? Is it the 14th, the 73rd? Where does it fall? Take a guess. Okay, down. Show us what the, what the reality is. 168, almost near the bottom of that list. Next slide. Should we be worried about this situation? I believe we should all be extremely worried, every one of us. On the other hand, should we despair? I, I don't think that is an option. I always remember the words of Bishop Desmond Tutu, who was one of the leaders that, that took South Africa from a situation of apartheid through to freedom. And he has lived through hell. And something he likes to say is that I'm not an optimist, but I'm a prisoner of hope. And I want to describe today some people who have been on a journey from despair to hope. Can anybody guess what this is? If, if, you're, if you're on Zoom, um, put down in the chat what, what you could imagine we are looking at right now. I don't see any guesses yet. Um, this is a bauxite processing facility. That is what you see in the background. Um, so bauxite is mined elsewhere and then brought to this place to be crushed into fine particles and then shipped on the sea. And this is actually in Gujarat, which is where my own family comes from, on the coast. And as you can see, the, 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 the bauxite itself is completely uncovered and there is only this small lane that separates that facility from a village. Um, next slide, Dallin. I, I met these ladies um, in that village, and we are standing here on top of that very terrace. I have I've blocked out their eyes just to protect them. And they said to me that living next to that facility was like living in hell. They, they, they explained, Kusum Ben was one of them, she explained that she would do the laundry and put it to dry and 
before the laundry was dry, it would be covered in that red bauxite dust. Or she would prepare food for her kids. And by the time the food was ready for the kids to eat, it would be covered in, 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 in bauxite. And there's a doctor about an hour from this place who saw a dozen children with kidney stones from this one small village, which is not normal. Children should not be getting kidney stones. They said, this thing is making us sick. And people were afraid to do anything about it because the contractor who runs that facility is in a state MLA and very powerful person, very ruthless person, and people basically afraid to do anything. But one day, one of those ladies who, was a, who, who sells groceries in that lane, she just got completely fed up. And she, she went out there to beg those young guys to, to, who were running the machines to slow things down and reduce the dust that was coming across the lane. And almost to spite her for, for, for having the courage to say that, the, the young men started picking up the dust and pounding it on the ground even harder so that it was exploding in her face. And she told me that when that happened, she, she lost it. Some, something in her mind snapped. And she went back to the village, found those other three women and about a dozen others. And they came out to the facility and they picked up stones and they threw the stones at those machines. And actually, they, they, they said the young guys, they just, when, when the ladies started throwing the stones, the young guys picked up their chapal and, 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 and ran away. And the facility got shut down um, for a couple weeks. Uh, but after that, it started up again, just the same as it had before. So what, what are these women supposed to do? India does have strong environmental regulations on the books, but these ladies have never heard of those laws and they have no idea about how to go about enforcing them. And they are not alone down. If you go to the next slide, this is data from the Comptroller Auditor General, which did a, sorry, one more, um, one more. Yeah, there it is. Um, which did an analysis of compliance rates in India with various environmental conditions. And the CAG found that compliance rate, non-compliance rates were as high as 57%, meaning we've got rules on the books, but they're not being followed. And that means tribal people living in the shadow of iron ore mines, fisher people whose waters are being poisoned by manufacturing facilities, slum dwellers who are breathing the worst of a city's air, everyone, every, everyone is affected by this, this enforcement gap in environmental law. And I wanna emphasize, and Dallin, if you could actually back up, <clears throat> I wanna emphasize, this is not just, one more, one more. This is not just a problem of India. I, I, my family's from Gujarat, but I grew up in the United States, and um, the, the organization that I started, which is called Namati, we work here in the US as well, which is where I'm calling from. And if anyone can guess, I'm gonna look at the chat, what this picture is. This is in Baltimore, which is a city about an hour north of Washington, D.C., the capital of the United States. And these are open piles of coal that are brought from West Virginia, where they are mined and then placed at the harbor in Baltimore and put on ships. And some of this coal actually likely goes to India. Um, and as you can see, it's not that dissimilar of a situation from the one I showed from Gujarat, where there are people living across the street from these open coal piles. And in the, in the foreground of this photo are young kids who are playing basketball right in the shadow of that coal. And these people as well say similar things that, that um, the presence of that coal is making them sick. So I, I wanna emphasize that this is, this is a universal problem. Environmental injustice is everywhere. And I think it's crucial that we recognize that universality and that we work in solidarity to tackle it, even while many of our governments are turning inward. So the group I work with, which is called Namati, we focus on legal empowerment, which is about demystifying law, making it simple, giving ordinary people the ability to use it themselves. And to do that, you need to go beyond lawyers. I, I am a lawyer myself, and um, some of my best friends are lawyers, but, but we have been part of the problem. We have contributed to a culture of law that is elite and inaccessible. And so in particular, at Namati, we have focused on what we call community paralegals, sometimes we're called barefoot lawyers, who can create a bridge between the formal promises of law on the one hand and real life on the other hand. 
And what paralegals do is they demystify law. They try to make it simple and they equip ordinary people to use it themselves. And so if you could show Dallin, I, I have a picture of one of our community paralegals who these ladies met. And he, he knew that there, were, uh, there was problems with this facility, but it, no one was willing to do anything about it. it. When he heard about this incident where the ladies threw the stones and the, and the place got shut down for a couple of weeks, he went and found those ladies. And he said, I am so admiring that you had the courage to do something about this. And I am sorry that the results that you got were not, were, 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 were temporary. But if you are game, I have another road we can follow. And that is the road of law. We could make use of the law. And the, the lady said they were game. Um, and the first thing that he did is show them the clearance letter, which is something issued by the state government, uh, the Pollution Control Board um, of the state government. And it says that the facility can operate, but it has to comply with specific conditions. And that, that letter is in English, but these folks don't speak English. And they had never, never seen that letter. They'd, they'd been living for many, many years in the shadow of this facility, but they had never seen the conditions under which that facility was bound. And so the community paralegal who, 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 who's here, he explained what some of those conditions were. And immediately the ladies could tell that there was a difference between what was on paper and what was happening in practice. So they used that information to put in a small application. They didn't go to a lawyer. It didn't go in the paralegal's name. It went in the ladies' names themselves. And they put an application saying, we have seen the conditions. We have evidence of noncompliance. We are asking you to come, come and take a look. And when they did that, initially nothing happened, but they went and followed up at the office. And eventually um, they were able to get someone to come and pay a visit. And indeed, when the inspector came, he recognized that there were gross violations. Um, and he issued an order saying, a show cause notice saying to the company, why is it that you are not complying with these regulations? I mentioned before that the, comp the, the head of that company is a, is a uh, MLA. And so he basically ignored that, that notice. He didn't do anything about it. But the ladies did not give up. They ended up traveling all the way to the state capital, Gandhi Nagar and um, making an appeal in person and saying, look, your own official, your own officer has issued this notice, but the company's continuing to ignore it. And um, we, 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 we are just asking that the rules on the books be enforced. And so from the state capitol, they actually issued a closure notice, um, ordering the company to stop its operations until it came in compliance with the rules. And the rules actually require the company to build a go down so all of that uh, bauxite is processed um, indoors rather than just being open and spraying on this, this village. And so Dallin, if you could show everybody, I went back a year later, this is the same terrace. I'm saying on the, standing on the same terrace and you can see the difference, the place got shut down. Go back a couple slides down just to remind folks of the contrast of what it looked like when the facility was operating. There it is. Uh, and then same terrace, a few slides later, um, a year later, and, 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 and the, uh, the women said to me, we can now do our laundry and the clothes aren't red. We can feed our children food and there's not this bauxite masala on top. And we can breathe again. We can breathe again. We weren't able to breathe before. We can breathe again. And perhaps even more important than that, there was a shift in attitude. One of the ladies said to me, I now know there is law on my side. And they felt less afraid, less afraid to take action, less afraid of the MLA who ran the company next door. They felt greater power among themselves. And that, that is the transformation we are looking for with legal empowerment. Um, let, let, let's show the next slide, Dallin. Yeah, they, they kind of went on a legal empowerment journey where it started as an impact, which is a, something that was hurting them. And then once they understood more about law, they could reconceive of that impact as a violation, something that was breaking rules that belonged to them. And then they used that knowledge of the law to pursue a solution, a remedy. And so that's the sort of journey that we are aiming to foster everywhere. Uh, next slide, Dallin. <clears throat> I just wanted to show you, you know, I mentioned that we work with community legal workers in India, but also here in the States. And this is Terrell Askew, who's a friend of mine and a community legal worker from Baltimore. Um, and I just took his picture in front of that coal pile. And he is working with communities there, inspired by that work in Gujarat, 
following a very similar process, helping folks to understand what the rules say and navigating the administrative solution, administrative institutions to try to get a solution. Um, next slide, Dallin. <clears throat> yeah, I, I wanted to say that this process of legal empowerment doesn't just happen one problem at a time or one case at a time. This is really a pathway towards improving the systems and the rules themselves. And what we have found is across many cases, that experience teaches us how a system is working in practice. And when people come together across their many cases, they can identify patterns and ways in which the rules that we have now are insufficient. And they can use the experience of those cases to argue for improvements to rules and systems. Um, in, in India, that, that, this legal empowerment cycle from casework um, building towards systemic change has le led to improvements in sand mining regulations, improvements to the way uh, the coastal zone regulation is enforced in, in Karnataka. Um, and there are paralegals and communities that we work with across four states, as well as many others uh, working with other groups around the country who have managed to, to turn this wheel. I should say that the experience from casework is also useful in resisting harmful dilutions to environmental law, including some that are happening as we speak. For example, the um, EIA, the Environmental Impact Assessment Notification, as many of you know, is up for revision this year and risks being diluted significantly. And the casework of ordinary people trying to make the rules work is valuable in uh, trying to make the case that those rules should not be diluted. Um, so in, in closing, I would like to say, um, and down if you could come back to the next slide, that legal empowerment is something that everybody can do, all of us can do this in our own community. You can be a paralegal, just like the two gentlemen I showed you in your own life. And here's what you need to do, it's very simple. Look for environmental harms. They're not hard to find if you look. Pollution of water or of air, of land, or on the flip side, environmental opportunities. If there's a degraded landscape near you that could be reforested, for example, that's step one. Step two. Find out what the rules say. Oh, sorry, get, get, get to know the people most affected. That is crucial. Just like the paralegal I showed you, you got to know those ladies who are living next door. Reach out, just like those young men in the video that we saw earlier, reach out, get to know the people most affected. Thirdly, find out what the rules say. Find out what the clearance letter says. Find out what, what the rules on the books are. And then try to use those rules to pursue a solution. Next slide. And drawing on that experience, wh whether you win or you lose, come together with others to advocate for better rules. Because if every one of us engages, you can go to the next slide, Dallin. If, if every single one of us comes to know law, use law, and shape law, then we will build, be building a deeper version of democracy. One in which we can put the planet and ourselves, people above profits. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I'm going to close with. I did want to share a few resources on how you can do this work in your own community. The one on the left is a, is a guide for how community paralegals can work for environmental justice. And again, er, anyone can be a community paralegal. The second one breaks down specific provisions in, in Indian environmental law and shows how each of them can be used to solve a concrete problem. So it makes the rules simple and it gives you examples of how you can use those rules. And the third one is a global community of people who are pursuing this, this passion of legal empowerment. And I invite all of you to join it. Um, so we got a few minutes left. And if folks are on the phone, I would love to um, address any questions or have a discussion. I do see one here. Let's see. The machines, the implementation standards of the regulations are flouted right when they are being implemented. Those who come to check also pass a bland eye. I cannot, for the life of me, understand why the industry owners believe how they can get, scot get off scot-free. Even if the law doesn't punish them, the environment will. Someday the environment will punish them. Yeah, but we should wait until the environment punishes them. I think those rules belong to all of us. And so the, the spirit of legal empowerment is um, that it is by ordinary people 
learning those rules, invoking those rules, that we can ensure that they come to life. Um, someone has asked about the EIA 2020, um, and it looks like we've got a couple others in the Q&A box. Um, EIA 2020, I, I, am, I am worried, and I actually would, would point out that there's a, there's a really disturbing parallel. Here in the United States, we have something called NEPA, which is the National Environmental Policy Act, and it is the equivalent of the EIA notification in India. It sets out the basic framework by which we can make decisions about industrial projects that pose some risk to environment. And very concerningly, during the pandemic, the US government went ahead with, with really damaging dilutions to that law, despite thousands and thousands of public comments asking for the contrary. And I, I fear that the same thing is happening in India. And so I, I would just underscore um, this reality that these problems of environmental justice, of um, failure to enforce the rules we have, and then dilution of those rules, these problems are, are, are taking place in many places, if not everywhere. And it is crucial that ordinary people, like, like the ones on the phone right now, connect and work in solidarity to make the best use of the rules we have and work towards improvements of those rules and, and defense of those rules when, when we do have them. <clears throat> so yeah, that's, that's my plug for global solidarity from an from a, um, American-born Desi across the ocean facing very similar issues here in the States as the ones that I see in my, my native place of, of Gujarat and elsewhere in India. Um, let's see, you've got a few others. I'm scrolling up. We have one in the Q&A box, uh, Vivek. If there's any okay. evidence to show that the environmental degradation accelerates uh, human depreciation and shortens lifespan for both rich and poor and unsustainable economies. Is there any research linking the two? Uh, yes, unfortunately, yes. There's, there's um, very clear research. Um, there was a recent study that showed that air pollution is one of the most significant causes of premature death in India. Um, and so, yeah, these aren't abstract concerns. Um, it's not exclusively about the wildlife, though it is about wildlife. It's about our own health. And um, these, the, these, our failure to steward um, our environment and the impunity with which industries pollute is, is making us sick and, and making us die. And actually the, the pandemic has really brought that out in stark relief. Um, Harvard University just published a study looking at the United States and they found that <clears throat> communities who are subject to greater air pollution are dying disproportionately of the coronavirus. And so um, it is one of the things that makes people more vulnerable to this, to this specific disease. Yeah, and we have another uh, question Please. on financial systems. So financial systems do not account for the cost of production of natural resources. Doesn't this global subsidy allow all of us to shortchange indigenous communities who own these resources? Mm. Yeah, I, I, I love that question. I think we've got things backwards right now. And I, I think we need to move out of an old paradigm. I would say sort of 20th century thinking was, well, we're going to have to compromise the environment in order to develop, you know, you can't have both. And so we need to pollute some, you know, destroy, destroy some rivers and, and, and emit some dirty things in order for us to develop. And, and it's, you can't, you can't have both. So we need to choose and let's choose development. I think that's 20th century thinking. I think now in the 21st century with the reality of climate change and the finiteness of the resources that we all depend on, it has never been more clear that that is a false choice and that we shouldn't be uh, thinking of ourselves as having to choose between environment or development, but rather we should be opting for a form of development that is consistent with air we can breathe, water we can drink, um, and, and uh, stewardship of the lands we depend on. We, we, we need to be able to choose both of those things and that, that should shape the kind of development that we pursue. And uh, we have another one here uh, uh, as to what kind of challenges have you found paralegals face while working in mm. communities? Uh, what are the skill sets that are required? Mm. Great question. Great question. 
um, well, you saw that I had put the put the um, the black stripes on their eyes, and you know the the reality is that um, there are great power imbalances all over the world, and um, standing up for environment oftentimes attracts some form of retaliation, and so um, one of the things that paralegals face is that is that risk, and I think the more of us who take part in this work. Um, the more normal it will become. Uh, and, and the more young people, the more students, the more professionals who work as paralegals in their own lives, um, the, the, the more we can defend and protect the ones who are most, most vulnerable. So that, that, that is one set of challenges. And I think we can all be part of the solution to that one. Um, <clears throat> there's also just a degree of complexity and um, sort of technical heaviness of environmental law. It's not simple. It's written in a way almost designed for people not to understand it. And so it does take time to try to comprehend it, break it down and simplify it. And I think the again, the, the more ordinary people take that effort to use the rules as they are now, the more we can also identify where the rules are overly complex and use our experience to argue for simplifications of those rules. So there too, I think, um, I think that uh, participation from everyone in this crucial system that we all depend on can work to, to make the system better and to address that challenge. Yeah, we have a couple of more uh, coming in. Uh, how about relocation? Will re is relocation a win-win or uh, mm. how do you see uh, relocation in the context? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, and it's live in India and around the world. Um, I mean, one of the things that I think is really important to remember about the Indian uh, legal framework is the Forest Rights Act, um, which for scheduled tribes allows people to say no to relocation. Uh, the, the, the term um, in international law is free prior informed consent. And the Forest Rights Act of 1996 it guarantees uh, forest dwelling tribal communities the ability to have their, to, to exercise their free prior informed consent. And I, government, the, the Indian government has recently announced <clears throat> um, a number of new coal blocks that they are planning to put up for auction. And I just think it's important for all of us to remind um, the government of that provision in the Forest Rights Act that ultimately these communities have the right to choose whether they want that mining to take place on their land or not. And if, if a Gram Sabha, meaning a, a local public assembly, decides that they do not want it, then, um, then we all have to abide by that decision. That's what free prior informed consent means. So I think the right not to be displaced is a really crucial one. And in Indian law, it is provided, at least to some people, um, outside of that specific context of, of tribal communities who are covered under the Forced Rights Act, um, I would not go so far to say that we, 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 we would never be able to justly um, uh, move people because there are um, sometimes absolutely critical public infrastructure projects um, or maybe even to preserve some of the environment, you, you know, in order to have like, let's say an elephant corridor or a, um, a, an integrous uh, uh, a wildlife corridor you may have you may have to move people, but I think historically, when we have done that, um, societies and governments have badly, badly failed the basic human rights protections uh, that that should go along with that. Because when you take somebody, someone out of their home, you are doing something really monumental, um, and so you have to. The, the only way we can do that justly, if those people are receive. Um, True, truly um, reasonable and dignified uh, terms. And, and, and that means accommodations, it means a, a place where they can live and where, where they can make a living um, and where they have control over what their new reality looks like. And we have time and time again failed to do that in, in a reasonable way. And that's not just in India, that is all over the world, including here in the United States where I'm sitting. <clears throat> Okay, great. Uh, Vivek, I think we are almost out of time. Uh, yeah, there are a couple of uh, questions pouring in a lot more gratitude than questions mm. also. Mm. But uh, yeah, any uh, last parting message given the, you know, the questions that you've seen now? Uh, yeah. 
Well, I, I appreciate people waking up at 6.30 in the morning to tune in. And um, it's Independence Day. I mean, I, I think um, India is one of the world's great democracies. <clears throat> but that democracy, like many democracies today, is under threat. And in order for us to escape this environmental crisis that we are in, we're going to need to deepen that democracy. And I, I invite all of you to be a part of that. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks so much, Vivek, uh, for your remarkable work and illuminating perspective. Thanks for joining us. Take care, everyone. Happy Independence Day. Peace.